of things. A first taste of freedom. After a traumatic life in the laboratory, these chimpanzees can now see open sky. Move freely. Touch another chimpanzee. Chimps show there's no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. But they've been made to stand in for us in medical research. Now, that's changing. There's been an evolution in our thinking. I had really no idea that by this point in time, we would be discussing the retirement of chimpanzees. It's a new beginning. In the 1980s, I met my first chimp. He was part of a research program, and I found it very unsettling, as chimps are our closest living relatives. Now that family tie is being recognized. In a bold move by the U.S. government, their research chimps will be retired. So what happens when a lab chimp is retired? <laughs> This isn't the wilderness of Africa, but it is home for Conan and his large family. There are 25 members, each one of them a complex individual. They're fortunate to be here. This is Chimp Haven. Tucked in a quiet corner of Louisiana, it opened its doors in 2005. It's a special retirement home, and the residents have come here after particularly demanding jobs. More are on their way as the U.S. National Institutes of Health starts the process of retiring its lab chimps. Chimp Haven veterinarian Dr. Raven Jackson is escorting a group of chimps to their new home. I'm extremely excited. This is now uh, one of many um, trips that I've taken to uh, transport chimpanzees from the uh, research setting into the sanctuary setting. And each time, I can't say that the, the excitement has diminished at all. For Dr. Jackson, it's a turning point. Due to NIH's recent decision, I'm now a part of history. And this will be something that we'll be able to look back upon, and even in my own personal life, that I'll be able to look back upon and know that I was a part of uh, making a difference in the lives of these chimpanzees. A quick pit stop to check on the chimps. Our DNA is almost identical to theirs, meaning viruses can pass both ways. The chimps are wary and watchful. Sean, you all right? Luckily, Dr. Jackson can speak their language and knows how to break the ice. Part of our MO is that we say two months after um, arriving at Chimp Haven, we get to see their true personalities. They know, okay, this is the routine, this is where I'm going to be, things are safe. They'll learn, too, that these welcoming faces can be trusted. These chimps aren't ready for that yet. They're 
on alert. They don't recognize the people or the place. Chimps, like humans, are suspicious of change, and these ones have every reason to be, given their past. You're doing good. It's gonna be okay. As he's unloaded, Peppy's strength, five times that of a human adult male, threatens to overwhelm the staff. If he were sedated, it would have been easier for them. But the sanctuary avoids the trauma of sedation unless absolutely necessary. Once in their bedrooms, the newcomers explore and settle in. They'll spend two weeks here in quarantine. denying it's still captivity but these chimps couldn't survive in the wild here these highly social animals can easily interact and will live in large groups the hope is they can begin to forget their former lives in the lab but it won't happen overnight Sean and Coco were rocking, and that sometimes is a sign of stress. They've had a lot going on today. They're just meeting new people. They're in a new area. So I would expect to see things like that. I was giving it on a 1 to 10 scale. I say today was about a 7. With young adult, adult males, of course, you saw that, you know, that group strength that they have. It takes a lot of concerted energy and effort in order to get them safely into their bedrooms and enclosures. So now I can finally take a deep breath and know that it, it was successful. Their lives at Chimp Haven will be very different from what was once considered acceptable. I must keep the secret of the flavor. For years, chimpanzees have been a source of entertainment, from ads for tea to circus attractions. They were our surrogates in space. crash test dummies. Chimpanzees were used in an effort to understand all aspects of human health. Most people didn't know how special they were. But scientists believed that their bodies were good substitutes for ours. It was around the same time that Jane Goodall made some startling discoveries. Her work revealed that traits we considered uniquely human were anything but. To her, watching chimpanzees was like looking in a mirror. But the scientific establishment wasn't interested in her approach. For me, it was the fact that the chimps are so like us. And it's not just in the gestures and postures they use, but they have their own individual personalities. They can uh, feel anger and fear and pain. And when I got to Cambridge in England to do a PhD, I was told I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, they should have had numbers, and I could not talk about them having personalities 
or minds capable of problem solving and absolutely not emotions because those were unique to us. Goodall allowed us to see chimps as individuals. Fifty years later, the effort to identify chimpanzees continues with ethicist Lori Groon and has taken on a whole new meaning. This is Duina and this is Pan. These were two of the first four chimpanzees um, that were in research labs in this country in the 1920s. Her interest in chimpanzee welfare led her to create the Last 1000 Chimps website. It tracks captive chimpanzees who have been, or still are, used in biomedical research in the U.S., the last developed country to allow it. The idea of the last 1000 was a way of taking an abstract notion that there are chimpanzees in laboratories and maybe we should end chimpanzee research and retire them. The hope is to turn as many of the names on the last 1000 site green, which means that they've been retired from the laboratory. I think it's important to identify the chimpanzees by name, um, both to honor and represent them as individuals, and oftentimes to be able to identify and empathize with another is a central part of what moves people to action. Each chimpanzee who arrives at Chimp Haven is an individual, a unique personality. But to thrive, they need to live with others, just like wild chimps and us. Today, four recent arrivals are coming out of quarantine. Over the next couple of days, they're going to be introduced to complete strangers who will eventually become their family. They all know that something's up. Before they meet their future family, they're given time to become familiar with their new play area. The chimps aren't the only ones with a sense of anticipation. Four females. First, Little Rose and Star. Christy waits for Queenie Latifah. Their first tentative steps into a place they've never been. This is their moment in the sun. Fresh breeze. Soft grass. No bars to block their view. Simple pleasures denied for much of their lives. They're in their 30s, except for Queenie Latifah, who is 45 and was taken from the wild. At their age, they've probably endured the worst conditions of research labs. You coming up, Star? You're a little uneasy, huh? Introductions are carefully planned. Distractions are delivered just before the first encounter. Out come Ladybird, Phyllis, Penny, and Sandy. They've only been at Chimp Haven for a few months, but they see this as their turf. This is when the going could get rough. But Chimp Haven co-founder and behaviorist Amy Fultz has managed over 200 of these first-time meetings. The chimpanzees during the introduction um, did, usually are very active at first, especially the first 10 minutes. Uh, they have this big burst of energy, and then things tend to settle down, and then there's typically another outburst. And that's pretty typical of chimpanzee social groups all the way around. We 
chimps over here. These two chimps are greeting each other for the first time. See the panning? You see the lip touching? That's positive. And inspection. All positive interaction. But they're understandably cautious. Some of the chimpanzees have been isolated for long periods of time, and that can really affect their ability to live in a chimpanzee family. And often with those individuals, we find that we have to take a slower approach. Complicated dynamics. Amy and her staff watch for specific cues. What I like to see in an intro is a lot of the friendly behavior. So things like embracing or hugging. Um, chimps do a behavior called mouthing, where they put their mouth on somebody, and a lot of times they'll pant when they do that, and that we'll call a pleasure pant or a friendly pant. And so those are good things that we like to see. We like to see the chimpanzees reach out to each other, too. That's a very positive behavior. <laughs> Not everyone adjusts to the open space. It looks like Christy might be a wall walker. It's thought that former research chimps feel safe near concrete, a familiar element from the lab. The next day, the delicate business of family building continues. Harry and Julius come charging out. Julius wastes no time establishing his rank as head of the group. Chimpanzees have what we call a dominance hierarchy, and that typically in the wild, there's one male who's what we call an alpha, or he's the boss. He's the one who's in charge. And then the other males kind of follow after him, and then the females are typically under all of the males. Chimpanzees can be devious, not so different from us. Penny was mouthing Queenie Latifah's brow, acting as if she was being friendly, and then she turned around and bit. Penny has let Queenie know who's running the show. For Queenie, it's been a jarring entry to a new life. Retirement has its challenges and its surprises. Not all the chimps here are senior citizens. The day starts early for chimpanzees. And the humans here don't have a lot of choice but to go along with it. All right, everyone touched it, so we'll make sure Mary gets them. <laughs> you want to do my food toss? Or uh, have food? Mm -hmm. No empty calories for the chimps. The colony consumes about 124,000 kilograms of greens per year. Let's do it. Yeah. Conan's family heads to breakfast. It's a veritable traffic jam as the chimps move from their bedrooms to their forest habitat. This morning, Lindsay Peters has the choice job, feeding the boisterous group. So, uh, mostly what they get is greens and, yeah, a lot of veggies that they get in the morning. And they know that whenever everybody goes outside, then they get the big rewards, like apples, oranges, bananas, stuff like that. Lindsay has been at Chimp Haven for five years. 
so she knows the needs and temperaments of these chimpanzees. Come in! Ready? Oh, good job. Conan's the alpha of the group. Um, Conan moves a little slower because he has arthritis, so he'll usually, whenever they're all out here getting their food, he'll usually do one big spurt to let them know that, hey, I'm the alpha, and then we usually feed him, and he kind of calms down. With 25 members, Conan's family is the largest at Chimp Haven. Conan's a proud papa to a few of the youngsters. They weren't bred intentionally, but Conan's vasectomies failed. The oops babies, as they're affectionately known, have given this elderly group a bit of get up and go. I, I played softball since I was five, so it kind of comes in handy. <laughs> Lindsay aims right for the little ones. Competition for the fruit is fierce. Now that she's over a year old, Ginger's letting Natalie kind of get off of her, and she'll go uh, forage for food as well. So the babies are definitely learning from their moms how to get food, and they don't get everything. <laughs> After a raucous morning, Conan's group goes inside to escape the heat of the day. Well, at least most of them do. Amy Fultz takes the opportunity to walk through the forest to see what the chimps do when no one's watching. This five hectare space lets the chimps experience life on the wild side. Chimpanzees in the wild eat things like termites and ants and bugs and we can see with this log where they've stripped the bark and it looks like they've been going after the ants or the grubs. <laughs> In this setting, the chimpanzees do what comes naturally. The earliest clues about chimpanzee culture came from Jane Goodall. It was after months of watching chimps in the forests of Tanzania that she made one of the most important scientific observations of modern times. It was really exciting for, for two reasons for me. It was, near, it was in the fourth month of the study and I just saw this dark shape crouched over a termite mound and a black hand reaching out and picking a blade of grass and it was obviously being used as a tool and I could see termites being picked off and that was exciting in itself chimpanzee using a tool but a few days later there were two chimpanzees and these were my two first the ones who first stopped being afraid David Greybeard and his companion Goliath and they were not only using pieces of grass as tools but they were picking leafy twigs and to make them into a tool they had to strip the leaves and at that time, the definition of us was man, the toolmaker. A definition that set us apart was wiped away. The chimps show there's no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. The chimpanzee culture that Goodall spent years uncovering is in full display at the edge of the forest. With the moat as their only barrier, Conan's family can be themselves. The artificial termite mound is a favorite destination for Megan and Magnum, especially because it's filled with applesauce, arguably better than termites. Little Valentina Rose ignores the industrious adults. Clearly, she has other things on her mind. There's lots of open space where Susanna and Candy can each have some time alone. Megan and Passion can relax and groom 
an important part of chimpanzee bonding and friendship. The grassy field gives the more domineering chimps room to work out their grievances. And Tasha can hunt for tasty morsels hidden in the grass. The youngsters love nothing more than climbing. On a hot summer day, a bucket-sized popsicle is the ideal treat. Adults get first dibs, but the youngsters try to muscle in. Diane is only five, but she likes to piggyback Natalie in a pretend game of mother and baby. High above ground, seven-year-old Tracy is an avid tree climber. Not all of the chimps are comfortable climbing, but Tracy was fortunate to have learned from her wild-born mother. After decades of studying chimpanzee behavior, we've discovered that much of what we thought was instinct, like climbing or using tools or carrying babies, is learned and passed on from one chimpanzee to another, like it is in humans. It seems Valentina Rose was paying closer attention than she let on. But just because the family has learned many of the skills of wild chimpanzees, doesn't mean they could be released into the wild. They can't be reintroduced into Africa right now. The African sanctuaries are full. The, they're losing habitat there, and the chimpanzees here at Chimpaven wouldn't know how to survive in wild Africa. They could also introduce diseases into the wild. That's because about half the chimpanzees at the sanctuary were deliberately infected in the lab with HIV and hepatitis. The infected chimps live here in a separate part of the compound. Dr. Jackson checks on them daily. It's taken time, but she's figured out their personality quirks. Kiwi is a very sociable chimp. He's um, very submissive in his group, but he loves human interaction. Um, he's actually known for what we call the peewee dance. I um, mean, that's a little two-step. <laughs> a little two-step. Go Kiwi. Go Kiwi. Go Kiwi. When Pee Wee arrived at Chimp Haven in 2008, Dr. Jackson didn't know what had happened to him in the lab. I can't reach you up there. I can't reach you up there. The research histories um, aren't the, the greatest. You know, we do get medical records, um, and it doesn't always include their research histories. While Pee Wee was in quarantine, Jackson discovered that he was HIV positive. He is one of the hundreds of chimps who were bred specifically for HIV research in the late 1980s and 90s. At that time, the pressure was on to find a cure for HIV AIDS. It was during the same era that Jane Goodall learned of the terrible conditions chimps were subjected to in the name of research. We had a session on conditions in some captive situations and never can I forget secretly filmed video of chimpanzees in medical research. Tiny cages. Why were they there? Because their bodies were admittedly so like ours that scientists felt they could use them like guinea pigs for learning about human disease, its cures and vaccines refusing to admit the equally dramatic, uh, you know, behavioral similarities. And so there they were, in these bleak, barren cages, maybe 30, 40 years. The HIV research was a dead end. Chimpanzees do not get sick from the virus in the way humans do.
hundreds of chimps were left languishing in biomedical labs. But now, they were highly infectious, as well as psychologically damaged. Dr. Jackson's goal is to keep the infected chimps healthy and happy. I may see subtle abnormalities in their blood work and we'll start supplementing just trying to maintain and salvage, um, you know, their quality of life. Today, Pee Wee and the rest of the infected chimps in Coco's group are moving to this new open air space. Kathleen Taylor has worked in biomedical research. For her, this move is an important step. Kathleen, Shakani, and care staff, you can release Coco's group into their New York. Good job! Knowing some of the worst housing conditions in the past, working in the labs and seeing something like this, this is like they won the lottery. This is just so immense. But it's just the first stage. So we want to make sure that we temper the environment so that the next spot where they'll go out into the forest um, over here, that they uh, that they'll be able to handle that with ease. <laughs> Space to roam is one thing. But sometimes you have to think outside the box to keep chimps occupied. We think Christ. Yeah. At Chimp Haven, everyone has a favorite. When I started here uh, four years ago, uh, Midget was uh, very aggressive towards me. Um, he'd spit, he'd um, always um, vocalize toward me. <laughs> A lot of negative interaction um, between the two of us. So I decided that I'd take the time to mend and create a bond and relationship with him. And I realized that was all he ever really wanted um, from the very beginning was my attention. Major Man! I love my handsome man! Like Midget, the chimpanzees who arrive at Chimp Haven have been shaped by their traumatic histories. Take Henry, for example. He likes to watch the world go by. But before coming here, he was isolated and neglected. Uh, Henry's a special case. He was actually um, a rescue chimp. He was um, a, a pet uh, at home, and he was rescued by the Houston SPCA. And he came here having never seen a chimp, not knowing how to act like a chimp. And he's actually grown to become the dominant male in his group. Henry! Mark knows all the personalities here. Grandma, she's going to be 61 in December, and she's uh, our oldest chimp and one of the oldest in captivity across the country. Um, she was actually born in the lab. Her parents were two of the first 100 chimps in research, so they know her exact birthday as opposed to the ones that were born in the wild and were captured there. Although conditions have improved in labs, Chimpanzees who come here still carry the weight of their past. My background when I started working in the laboratory situation was chimps were singly housed, a lot of them, and they never got to touch another chimp. They never got to groom and do the activities that, again, while their wild counterparts did. And when you see that happen here, where they get to touch a chimp for the first time, and they start grooming and making the sounds, and it's, it's like they're growing. Mark uses simple training to help build trust. It's a contrast from the invasive procedures these chimps may have experienced in the lab. Foot. Uh. 
good boy. Good job. So what I'm doing is uh, part of our positive reinforcement training program. And what we do is we ask the chimps to present body parts um, so that when they have a wound or something wrong and they're stressed out from that, they already know how to present it to us later so we can examine the wound, see if it's something that needs stitches, maybe it's something that just needs, uh, they just need antibiotics or some painkillers to get through it here. Or if they have like some swelling or something around from a bug bite or something like that. Arm. Belly. It's all for our medical uh, program. Uh, we just want to reduce their stresses when they might already be stressed out from some situation. Hi, Ivy. Thank you for the trash. This group was also trained a lot to um, clean the trash out of their yard, so they're always giving us whatever they find uh, when they come up and they see fruit, that they'll get a piece of fruit if they trade for it. With the training session over, the chimpanzees get a surprise visitor. Music can soothe any soul. The sanctuary uses it as a way to calm nerves and to engage the mind. The violin doesn't appeal to all of Steve's audience, but a few of the animals are wrapped. If a live violinist seems out of place here, that's kind of the point. Music is a pretty um, important part of our enrichment program. It's not something we do all the time just so that it stays as a novel activity because they'll start to habituate it after, after a while. But we definitely try to get different live musicians to come in. But, like It's always more interesting for a human to go to a live concert versus just listening to the radio. Boredom is the enemy. Enrichment is very effective in, in um, creating mentally healthy chimps and even helping to rehabilitate chimps that have come from environments that were limited in, in, their, um, in their past. It takes some creative thinking to keep these chimps busy. Many of them will be here for decades. If these chimps were in the wild, Hunting for food would drive almost everything they do. So it plays a big role at the sanctuary, too. Chaps tastes like onions. Like the enrichment team finds original ways for the chimps to forage for their food. It's going to go to the whole colony as part of their novel food. These are part of our occupational enrichment where they have to work to get the food. The chimpanzees will have to rip the paper off. Not so different from prying open nutshells or peeling bark off a tree. Carbs, protein, it's all good for the chimps. I'm making log foragers. So what we do is we try to get a, a substance that's the right consistency that'll stick to the logs um, when they're hanging. And then we hang them on the outside, and the chimps can spin it around. Aaron and Leilani's food grunts signal the arrival of the treats. I'll do one here. For chimpanzees whose health has been compromised, there's a lot of nutrition packed into playtime. And the eager chimps always love getting their hands dirty. Of course, they wouldn't see this in the wild, but the occasional movie offers many different sights and sounds, and novelty is key. Those chimps who don't care for Shrek can simply tune out. It's a strange thing, trying to find ways to engage and entertain chimpanzees when they're the ones who have always entertained us. But for chimps who were broken in the lab, behavioral enrichment can be transformative. 
a happy chimp is a healthy chimp, and that's really the goal of why we're doing it, is, you know, to try to give them the best life that, that we can possibly give them. And it's not just a one-way relationship. I've really found in working with chimps, the chimps that do take a little longer to, to win over, it's so rewarding to, to finally get them to the point where they trust you and, and these chimps especially have had such a um, such a background where their their interactions with people haven't always been positive. There's been an important evolution in our thinking. Taking care of complex sentient beings means more than just rescuing them from a difficult life. When you spend time with chimpanzees, you recognize the way in which life matters to them. Um, they care about things. They don't care about the same things we care about, but they care about a lot of things. They care about each other, they care about their human caregivers, they care about what to eat. Some like to eat grapes, some don't like to eat grapes. Some like to climb trees. Their lives have values that matter to them. Um, and insofar as we recognize those kinds of values as important in ourselves, similar values in others, I think from an ethical point of view, matter as well. What does the future hold for the last 1,000 chimps? We've come a long way toward recognizing the depth and emotional complexity of chimpanzees. I've met so many people when they have the opportunity to get up close with a chimpanzee or one of the other apes and they look into the eyes. They tell me that is a profoundly life-changing moment. There is an affinity and I think the apes and people feel it. Hey, buddy. <laughs> What pleases me the most is when you look into their eyes, they're allowing me that opportunity to look into their eyes, which means they trust me. They're not avoiding eye contact. They're up in the mesh and they're looking and they're peering at me just as, as, as I'm peering at, at them. How are you? Dr. Jackson won Midget's trust, but their special relationship was cut short. Midget was 44 years old, so, you know, that's considered a geriatric chimp. Um, he was a peacemaker in his group. Um, he was very, very special, special guy. I got a call shortly after midnight uh, stating um, that his breathing was labored, and I said, I'm on my way. Um, about the time I made it here, he unfortunately had passed away. It was hard, you know, that was, that was my boy. Um, but I did find solace in knowing that he was able to spend out the latter parts of his years here at Chet Haven and knowing that he was not only loved by myself, but he was loved by all of the staff here. Other chimpanzees here are at the beginning of their lives and could live for 30, 40 years, maybe longer. And as more and more of the 1,000 chimps are retired, Chimp Haven will need to expand. It's a costly proposition, but the U.S. is at a turning point. It's been a long road. When I first started working on topics related to captive chimpanzees something like 20 years ago, I had really no idea that by this point in time, we would be discussing the retirement of chimpanzees from laboratories into sanctuary. And um, that I was able in 2013 to develop the last 1,000 chimpanzee website with the expectation that I, in my lifetime, would be turning these names green is really joyous. Part of what my efforts are is to try to um, help to keep the momentum going, um, recognizing that this is a process. Chimpanzees aren't going to be retired all at once. That's because in a controversial move, the National Institutes of Health will choose 50 of these chimps for future research. It's a process that could take years. 
It means that some aging chimps won't live long enough to enjoy retirement. There are also chimps in private hands. Drug companies own about 450. They plan to retire them by 2020. This could be fast-tracked if the U.S. designates captive chimps as an endangered species, like their wild counterparts. It means a lot more chimpanzees will find safe haven in the care of sanctuaries. It's a life well deserved. It's often easy when you don't have a relationship with the animal to say, oh, it's just an animal. But it's truly not. These are beings. These are feeling, caring, loving beings. And they've put their life on the line for us unwillingly for so many years. It's only right that we give back. It's only right that we provide an environment where they can live out the rest of their lives. I held this bird in my hand 10 months ago, and here we are, deja vu. I've caught him again. It's a warbler. He's hit the window. Songbirds are disappearing. You can stand at the base of these structures and you just catch the birds as they're falling. Why is this happening? We are changing the environment faster than birds can cope with. That light is so powerful that it confuses birds. We have only half the birds now that we did back in the 1960s. Songbird SOS. Next time on The Nature of Things. is the number. It's your bio data, but it's theirs to sell. They can do what they want with it. Deluge by data. Next on CBC. Nothing beats night on. We're not pharmacologists. We work at TV and we got a license from Health Canada for this product. We really did. Very disappointing and very concerning. The shocking truth revealed.